Persons who hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly and are always taking the matter very seriously will have the personality of God in Sri Krishna manifested in their hearts within a short time. 
Mukam Kroti Vachalam Pangam Nagaya Tegrim Yatantri Dhammati Sri Guru Nidhatarham So the Srimad Bhagavatam as explained by Maharaj Prikshit later in the 10th canto is meant for Nibrita Tarshaya is meant for this kind of audience Nibrita Tarshaya Upagiyamara. Uh, Upagiyamara means the chanting of the glories of the Lord as uh, we do when we uh, read the Srimad Bhagavatam. So this Upagiyamara, this uh, glorifying of Krishna is meant for persons who are Nibrita Tarshaya. So uh, Nibrita, uh, you may know, this is signifying the end of material attachment. The opposite of this is poverty. They're actually in Vedic culture two margas, two paths. The poverty and nibriti. So the poverty marga is a path of regulated self uh, sense indulgence. <coughs> Generally, this corresponds, Prabhupada said this. Generally, in general, it corresponds to Grihasta Ashram. Also, in Varna Ashram Dharma, the whole Varna Ashram Dharma system can go, be called Pabriti Marga. And there are special religious processes, ceremonies, and so forth, which are Pabriti, <coughs> which means they are meant for those who are interested in expanding their uh, sense enjoyment material attachments, their involvement in this material world. So, now this is not to be derided as long as it is the Vedic Marga. Of course, Prabhupada did say, Pabriti means animalism, Pabriti alone, <laughs> simply animalism. But there is a Marga that regulates this. And so, those on the Pabriti Marga, they, are, they can be included in human life. <laughs> and the point of this Pabriti Marga is to bring one to Nibriti. Nibriti means the opposite. Pabriti means expanding uh, in, in the senses into the material world. Nibriti means withdrawing. So, Nibriti, renunciation, uh, Tarshaya. Nibriti, Tarshaya, Upagiyamana. So, Tarshaya is a form of the word Trishna. Trishna means thirst. So the word Trishna is very often used in connection with material desire, uh, being represented by thirst. When one is thirsty, when the throat is parched, then one is impelled by this thirst to, to quench uh, the dry feeling in the mouth and the throat. It goes looking for water. If one is in the desert, then it becomes very desperate. There's no water. And this thirst can drive one mad. And so, Krishna, thirst, represents... Oh, our Sanskrit scholar is here. Should we confirm what I'm saying? <laughs> so, uh, Krishna is used in this symbolic way to symbolize <coughs> the urges of all the senses. So, the hearing and chanting, appreciation of Srimad Bhagavatam is reserved for that class of man that is Nivriti Trishna or Nivriti Tarshaya, Tarshaya, who have given up the urges of the senses. So, how many here are Nivriti Tarshaya? Show your hands. Oh, you are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Except for one, <laughs> everyone else is honest. Not that you're dishonest, I believe you. <laughs> but you're a rare soul. <laughs> so then, the question is, so if most people in this world are not Nibriti Tarsayat, then what is the Srimad Bhagavatam for them? Should they not hear the Srimad Bhagavatam? Uh, should they uh, 
hear some Karmakanda Shastras or something like that, some Ramiyakata village talks. <laughs> no, they should also hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. This verse goes on to say, in the next line, Bhava Ausadach. There is another aspect to this process, Upagiyamala, that uh, even you are not Nibriti Tarasaya. If you hear, then it acts as medicine. Ausadach means medicine. Bhava refers to material existence. So uh, in this verse, Prikshit Maharaj is describing our existence in this material body as a diseased condition. <coughs> this is our disease. We are spirit soul, but we have taken on this material body. Uh, Prabhupada uh, gives a similar example of cataract on the eye. So the healthy eye is clear. One can see everything very nicely. But when one gets a certain kind of disease, I don't know what it's called, glaucoma or something, anyway, then a film grows over the surface of the eye. The eye becomes covered by a milky film and one can no longer see properly. Actually, this cataract, you get on both eyes, you become blind. But the cataract can be removed. There is a certain Ayurvedic medicine, there is a certain kind of salve, so that you know, there's a verse in the Brahma Sanghita which describes this uh, salve. <coughs> what is that? Premanjana hmm? Charita Bhakti Velochanina. That if one applies the ointment of Bhakti, Prema Bhakti, love of Godhead upon these diseased eyes, then one will be able to see Krishna. Lord Shamasundar, Lord Krishna, uh, his personal nature is Achincha Guna. He has inconceivable qualities. Therefore, he has names like Adhoksaja and uh, so on, Achincha. Hmm? These mean. Uh, uh, and uh, Avan Manasa Gokshara, these are different names of the Lord, which mean that we cannot uh, understand Him, we cannot grasp Him through these material senses. When the soul is dressed in this material body, then His power, His ability, His vision to see Krishna has become blocked. But the medicine of hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, Baba Ausar, cures that disease. It cures material existence altogether. Bhava uh, Ausadach. So therefore, whether one is Nivritti Tarsair, or whether one is uh, Habriti, or uh, Sarvakama, full of desires, still the hearing of this Srimad Bhagavatam is recommended. And as one goes on, Hearing. That means, of course, real hearing. Prabhupada is making a distinction here. That uh, one can hear from a professional reciter. Uh, Prabhupada is alluding to this in his purport. When he says, Maharaj Prikit, he had only seven days to live. But he's recommending, Srinvata uh, Shradhyad Nitya, to everyone else, that you should hear this Bhagavatam. Uh, Srinvata, Shwarya, with faith, Nityam. Always, not seven days. Maharaj Pritchard had no choice, because he was cursed. But uh, in India, and now it's spreading outside of India, we've come this... See, the problem is, is that foolish people, they imitate. Hmm? They imitate great souls like Maharaj Pritchard. They imitate great demigods like Lord Shiva, they imitate the Supreme Personality of God as Lord Krishna. And they take this imitation to be spiritual life. So, there is this fashion now called Bhagavad Saptaha. 
a professional reciter, whom, as Prabhupada says, he is not self-realized, uh, nor does he have any power to liberate his audience. Why is that? Because he's not in Nibriti Tarsayat. He's diseased. So, such diseased fellows, they may learn all 18,000 shlokas of the Bhagavad Gita. And they can sit down at any time and start reciting. And Prabhupada says, invariably, they will focus on the 10th canto, uh, those chapters which deal with the Lord's intimate lila, with the gopis. Uh, so, their mode of recitation and also the mode of hearing of these people who come only uh, for seven days, uh, that mode is contaminated. They're taking the transcendental subject of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Kata, to be material sense gratification. So that is like taking medicine and <coughs> diluting it or mixing it with other medicines according other substances according to one's own whims <coughs> and taking it as you like, not as the doctor prescribes. So when one does this, there are certain medicines which actually, uh, although they are curative when prescribed by the doctor, but when taken whimsically, they are poisonous. Uh, this is known also in Western medicine, Ayurvedic medicine certainly knows this, that there are poisons which can be used expertly uh, to cure disease. Even they make uh, medicine, very good medicine, to cure nervous diseases from cobra snake venom. Uh, I once saw uh, live a man who was expert in handling snakes. He was a professional. And he had a big collection of the most poisonous snakes in the world. Uh, the mamba and the crate and also the king cobra. So, in India sometimes you may see these ordinary cobras which are maybe this long. They're also very, very poisonous. But there is one kind of cobra called king cobra which eats those kinds of cobras. <laughs> the king cobra. And these, everyone knows the python. Python is a very big, thick snake. But king cobra gets that big. Uh, there have been reports of king cobras uh, something like uh, eight meters long. So uh, the python is simply a big snake. If it bites you, it doesn't really harm you. It has to wrap itself around and squeeze you. But the king cobra uh, doesn't have to wrap itself around to kill you. It just bites you once. It's called in some countries a two-step snake. You can take two step, steps. Because <laughs> it is so powerful. It has such powerful deadly poison. But this, I saw this, this man, the snake handler. He had different boxes with different snakes. And he opened the box for the king cobra. And this huge snake came out. This king, of course, this king cobra was small. It was only about two meters long. It's a little one. So he, he was very expert to move his hand and the king cobra would try to attack. But the king cobra that was occupied with this moving hand, he would come with the other hand behind him, just grab him by the throat and take him and then put his fangs. There's a, he had a, a jar with a kind of skin on the top. And then he would press the fangs of the snake through the skin and poison would come dripping out into the jar. And he would use that poison in uh, medical experiments with a team of doctors. They were developing medicines. So he was telling the audience how the king cobra venom is very effective for he was mentioning certain kinds of uh, nervous diseases where people, they, you know, the nerve deteriorates and they lose their coordination, they become spastic and like that. But if they take injection of this cobra venom, which is uh, prepared in a certain way and prescribed in a certain way, 
then it relieves this disease. But <laughs> if one is whimsical with cobra venom, <laughs> you see, oh, it's medicine, then, yes, let me take a whole huge syringe of it and inject it, you will die. You see? So it is the same with the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Srimad Bhagavatam, Baba Ausadach, it is medicine. But if we take it whimsically, then it has a poisonous effect. This is Krishna's potency. Huh? Krishna's potency. Baba said the same thing about the holy name. If we chant it with Shraddha, and uh, at least with Abhas, Abhas means uh, one is trying to overcome his offenses. It is not pure chanting yet, but one is trying with faith to overcome his offenses, trying to avoid ten kinds of offenses. Then this has liberating effect. This is the potency of the holy name. Even one is a dog eater. Even one has failed in everything. Even uh, failed in uh, trying to follow uh, the standard rules and regulations. But if somehow or other this person is able to chant Nama Bas, then all of his his sins, all of his contamination, is immediately cleansed. And this is declared in so many Shastri quotations. So this is the very power of the Holy Name. But the same power, if one chants with Aparad, offenses, then it is very, very dangerous. And Prophet exactly says, uh, milk touched by the lips of a serpent has a poisonous effect. So like that, uh, to chant the holy name in Naparat, it is like touching milk with a serpent's tongue. So yes, uh, if one uh, takes this Srimad Bhagavatam recitation whimsically, hearing from a professional man, uh, seven days this Bhagavad Saptaha, the effect will be poisonous. Actually, we can understand, <coughs> it's revealed in the scriptures, you know, for instance, fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam and the Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat by Sri Vrindavan Das Thakur, that at the bottom of this universe uh, there is Lord Vishnu and he is lying on the Anantashesh. And Lord Anantashesh is reciting with thousands and thousands of heads the glories of Lord Krishna. He is actually the original Bhagavatam reciter in this universe. And great souls like the four Kumaras, they travel down to the nether region of the universe to hear Bhagavatam class from Lord Anantashesh. Uh, so, uh, Lord Mahavishnu, he's lying on the Sheshnag, on the couch formed by Ananta's coils, and he's taking rest. He's uh, being soothed by this recitation of Krishna's pastimes. So he's taking rest and this recitation is pleasing him, comforting him, and so he's sleeping. Of course his sleep is not ordinary, he's yoga nidra, but within him, within him are all the jivas. And these jivas are sleeping actually under the tamo guna. And it's specifically said, there is an influence coming from Lord Anantashesh, he is called Tamasi, therefore. He, he emanates an influence, a Tamasic influence. And so for those who are not devotees of the Lord, who, do not, who are not attracted to Krishna, uh, then his influence puts them into the Tamuguna. And in that tam Tamasic state, they sleep and they dream. Uh, actually, it is Mahavishnu's dream. He's, He's creating this big dream of the material world. And these living entities are dreaming along with him. They enter into that dream and accept that dream as reality. Now what is that dream? You know, just like everyone, had, you, you, you may have had this experience yourself. If you're sleeping and someone is speaking to you, uh, uh, or you're hearing some music, but what you're hearing, you may have had the experience, that what you're hearing becomes incorporated in the dream. And uh, your mind makes it, you know, strange. 
your dreaming mind makes it very surrealistic and strange. And then uh, when you wake, if you wake up, then you see the situation. You see that something was being spoken and in your dreaming state you were taking it in a complete other ridiculous way. Uh, so it is just like that. <coughs> It's just like that. The activities of the living entities in this universe are actually based on this transcendental sound vibration of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is being recited by Lord Anantashesh. Always, eternally, at the bottom of the universe. He's always reciting. Uh, so the, this dream of material life is a perversion of that narration. And everything we're seeing here, where I am thinking that I am the Ishwara, uh, Ishwaro ham maham bogi, I am the controller, I am the enjoyer. We're thinking I am Krishna. And we are uh, imitating his pastimes. Even we don't know. We don't know what is Krishna. But that is the nature of things in this material world. It is a perverted reflection of Krishna's pastimes. So this is the, you can see here, this is the example, the clear example of the uh, poisonous effect, the powerful poisonous effect of Bhagavatam recitation. Uh, for those who are not, uh, they are neither Nibritta Thai Sire nor are they willing to take the Srimad Bhagavatam as medicine. They want to take it as sense gratification. They want to incorporate it into their life of sense enjoyment. So then it has a very, very powerful illusory effect. This is Krishna's potency. Prabhupada said, uh, Lord Krishna is just like fire. The chanting of the holy name is just like fire. So fire can be used for so many good things. But if you play with fire, it is very, very, very dangerous. Prabhupada gave the, his own example when he was a young boy. He was... Uh, had a box of matches and he was striking them and throwing the matches around. <coughs> but one match slipped from his hand and fell on his kadi doti and set it on fire. And had not some man suddenly appeared, Prabhupada used to say, Krishna sent this man. So had this man not suddenly appeared to roll him in the grass, Prabhupada indicated it might have been very, very serious. He still had a mark on his leg. So Prabhupada used to say, uh, used to give this story to illustrate how we should not play with fire, we should not play with this transcendental vibration of Lord Krishna. <coughs> Glorious. Yes. So, but when we receive this transcendental vibration in the proper way, as medicine prescribed by the proper doctor, then this has a very powerful curative effect. Shrotra mano Piramat, then it becomes very, very pleasing to hear Bhagavatam. Not in the sense of sense gratification, but in the sense of the higher taste of spiritual life, of Krishna consciousness. What happens is, Ka Uttama Shloka Gunanu Vadat. Then the heart becomes flooded with the glories of Lord Uttama Shloka, because this is the name of Krishna, Uttama Shloka, which means that He is that very transcendental vibration, Uttama Shloka, means the highest shlokas, the highest verses, the supreme verses of transcendental knowledge are these verses in Srimad Bhagavatam. And they transmit the glories, Nanubhada, they transmit the Vaikuntha qualities, qualities of Krishna himself. And this becomes manifest in the heart of the bona fide hearer of the bona fide reciter of Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, there are those who are uh, determined by their nature, they are determined to avoid this recitation. They will not come. And if somehow uh, they happen to come in contact with this transcendental vibration. They will close their ears to it. It will have no effect. So who are these people? 
they're called Pashugna. Puman, Yogir, Jeta, Pashugna. So this word Pashugna has two meanings. The word Pashu can be taken to mean animal. So an animal killer. One who uh, gets pleasure, gets satisfaction from killing animals, also meat eaters, those who are uh, very content to eat the dead bodies of four slaughtered animals. So this is one kind of Pashukna. He cannot develop attraction for hearing about Krishna. Another kind of Pashukna is the killer of the soul. Pashu can mean soul. So this is a person who, although he knows, he knows that uh, we should aspire for Nirviti Krishna. Maybe we are not, but we should take the medicine and become Nirviti Krishna. Give up all material desires. He's heard this, but he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He goes on with sinful activities. Manusha Janama Paya Radha Krishna Navajya Ajaniya Bisha Kainu. So Naratam Das Thakur is praying in one song. Janiya Shuniya Bisha Kaini. That although I have achieved this human form of life, this human form of life is meant for self and God realization. No, I have not shown any interest in that mission of human life. Radha Krishna Nabhajya. I neglected uh, willingly to worship Radha and Krishna. Whenever there was opportunity, I avoided. I turned away. And what did I do instead? Janiya Shunya Bisha I willingly drank poison. So Prabhupada said, this is a madman. This is a mad person. Someone who takes a bottle, it says very clearly, poison. <coughs> There's a skull and crossbones. <coughs> and he opens and glug, 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 drinks. We call him a madman. Yeah, so this is Pashugna, killer of his own soul. So such persons cannot enter into the transcendental nectar of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now this Bhagavatam, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Indriyani Mano good here, uh, Asya Dishtanam Uchate. So this Asya, what is? There is something, Asya, something which is hidden, which is secreted in Indriyani, the senses, Mano, mind, and the buddhi, the intelligence. What is hiding there? It is lust. Lust is hiding there. Now, if we take up uh, the uh, proper mode of life for the human being prescribed in the Vedic scriptures, if we live according to Varna Ashram Dharma, follow uh, the standard rules and regulations, then by that, the lust, it retreats from the senses because the senses are regulated, they're engaged in regulated activities under the Shastra. And also for the most part it retreats from the mind. But you see, mere activities alone that does not correct the intelligence. So the lust, this, this is where lust in, into the labyrinth of the intelligence, the lust retreats and hides there in the dark corridors. So, it is therefore not enough simply to accept uh, regulated activities, activities as prescribed in the scriptures, perform one's duty. It is not enough because the intelligence is still uh, uh, harboring lust and lust is waiting there looking for the chance to strike. When one is a little bit inattentive, then the lust will uncoil itself 
from the intelligence and strike in the mind and strike in the senses and bring us down. So this is why the hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam is so important. This is medicine which is specifically meant to enter into the buddhi. Uh, it is a torchlight of knowledge and this, this lust, this demon of lust cannot bear, cannot live in that light of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, actually, all success in spiritual life is to be found in developing a sincere attachment to hearing, to investigating this great literature of Srimad Bhagavatam. Everyone should consider this very, very carefully. If we find that we are very inclined to engage ourselves in productive work, that's very nice, that's of course uh, our process in Krishna consciousness. But if this is the limit of our interest, just to work hard and pro forma, follow sadhana bhakti, but we don't find an interest in the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, that compels us to study this great literature, to investigate its message, to go into the details, to make connections, to understand. And then should understand and then you should know that the labyrinth of the buddhi is dark and is dangerous. It is harboring a demon of lust. He is definitely there. Don't think that because of your activities that you frighten him off. No, he's there. And he's watching from that vantage point of the buddhi. And he's waiting for the first opportunity to strike whenever he can. So we have to go after it. It's not, it's not enough just to chase lust into that labyrinth and say, okay, we got rid of it. Now let's get down to work. Everything's okay. No. We do have to go after him. He must be driven out. And so for that we have to take this torchlight of knowledge called in the 11th canto Adhyatma Dipa, the light of Adhyatma, <coughs> means spiritual knowledge. Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita uh, that I am that, uh, Adhyatma Gyan, of knowledge, he says, uh, I am Adhyatma, there are different kinds of knowledge, but of different kinds of knowledge, I am Adhyatma, Adhyatma Vidya Vidyana. Uh, I am spiritual knowledge. In other words, Lord Krishna is saying, I am the Srimad Bhagavatam. That is myself. So we must take the torchlight of Lord Krishna in the form of Adhyatma Vidya and enter into this dangerous labyrinth with all of its corridors going in different directions. <coughs> and we must go into every corridor and illuminate it until we find that rascal, Mr. Lust. And as soon as he ex is exposed to that transcendental light, you know, it's just like the vampire story. <laughs> <laughs> he will turn into a skeleton. He will die. He cannot bear to live in the light of this Bhagavad Tattva Vigyan. So, uh, from bhakti yoga paribhavata hrit saroja ase shutekshita patananunata. It is stated in this Bhagavatam that when one seriously pursues the bhakti process, from bhakti yoga paribhavata, huh? when one seriously engages in bhakti yoga, as I said, there's twofold there, Prabhupada explained. Uh, one aspect of the serious pursuance of bhakti yoga is to engage the senses in devotional activities. But the other aspect is that we must purify the mind and purify the intelligence by hearing and chanting and remembering Krishna 
as he presents himself in the Srimad Bhagavatam and in his holy name. So this is a twofold process. So this is Paribhavata, this is serious practice. So for one who practices this Bhakti Yoga seriously, then the Lord, He appears within the heart. Shutekshita, He is seen by the hearing process within the heart. And He appears in the heart in that very form that we are accustomed, that we have become attached to hearing about. So actually, this is why Srimad Bhagavatam is so scientific. Because we want to become attached to Krishna, the original personality of God. We want Him to appear in His Satchidananda Vigraha within our heart. So that description, yes, it is in the tenth canto. But one must be qualified. One must, therefore, there are nine cantos before to step by step by step rid our intelligence of all impurity. Otherwise, if we go immediately to the tenth canto and we hear about Krishna's Rasa Lila and other such pastimes, and because not, and Mr. Lust is there in the intellect, he will strike. He will strike. And just like you can go to any bookshop <laughs> and you will see <laughs> You'll see uh, there is a section for uh, the young men, lusty young men, all kinds of dirty magazines, and, uh, sexy stories, sexy paperback books. And also there's a section for the young girls. This is the romance stories. It's, it's more, you know, sugary. <laughs> it's the same stuff. <laughs> the same dirty stuff. <laughs> so every, you see in these bookshops, people are swarming buying these titles, uh, describing the lusty affairs of young boys and young girls, and those uh, romance novels on the cover. There's always some pictures, some very ideal looking man with muscles and black hair. <laughs> And there's a, you know, a very sweet young girl in his arms, and, you know, with some title, uh, you know, South Seas Passion. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this material world, everybody, their intelligence becomes entangled in these kinds of descriptions. And if one hears about Lord Krishna, who is the original dark-haired youth, <laughs> and Srimati Radharani, who is the original delicate young girl, sweet young girl. And, but if one's intelligence is contaminated by such kinds of conceptions, then the whole uh, narration will be spoiled. It becomes aparad, it becomes poison. It becomes poison, not medicine. So, therefore, yes, this is medicine, but please, it must be taken according to the proper prescription. And here, in today's verse, we are learning that prescription, that one should hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly, not just seven days, but regularly, and always take the matter very seriously. That means to uh, develop an attachment to this hearing. When the buddhi becomes, is it curious to investigate this Srimad Bhagavatam, then you're on the right track. You see? Then you're on the right track. That means Mr. Lust, he's already packing his bags. <laughs> because the buddhi is probing into, wants to know, we want to know. What is this Srimad Bhagavatam about? But when we are not interested, when it is just a chore, or you know, a good 45 minutes to catch up on some lost sleep, 
<laughs> if that is our connection to Srimad Bhagavatam, then we should know that uh, Mr. Lust has made a very comfortable apartment in our intelligence. He's there, he's very secure. He's like one of those drug dealers <laughs> in New York. They get an apartment in some old building. It's an old, rotten building. But uh, that apartment where he lives is completely first class. And it has a very, all kinds of locks on the door. The door is solid steel and all kinds of locks. And people, it's like a fourth floor apartment. And people come down below when they hold up their money and he looks out the window. And he lowers a bucket. <laughs> and people put the money in the bucket and then he raises it up and then he puts the drugs in the bucket and lowers it down. This, he, they make this arrangement so that if the police come, they have to run up four floors and break through this heavy door. And he has plenty of time to flush everything down the toilet. And when the police come in, he's clean. They search for drugs, they can't find him. That's why they do this. So, these drug dealers, they feel themselves very, very secure in such an arrangement. So if we have no interest in the Srimad Bhagavatam, no inclination to investigate, then you should know you have a New York drug dealer <laughs> living in your booty, in your intelligence, and he's feeling very secure. <laughs> he's, he's feeling, you know, there's no problem here. <laughs> what can they do? <laughs> because it's a fact, the police and such, the police, they give up. They, 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 what's the use of, of making a big action, running up four flights of stairs, and then with a big battering ram, or a settling torch, <laughs> break through this door. When, when we get there, there'll be no drugs. So it's useless. So they give up. So one who has no interest in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is like that, we've given up. We've given up. So don't give up. It is guaranteed that this will have med medicinal effect, but you have to take it as prescribed. Srimad Nityam Grinatascha Svatishtitam Kalena Nati Dirgena Bhagavan Vishati Hridi If you take it seriously, hear it regularly, you will have the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna manifest in your heart short time. Kuntra Srimad Bhagavatam ki jaya ki jaya Dr. Mani in the canto he states that by adopting the priority of devotional service our conduct to God becomes a life of pain. So in part of also states said that if you follow this process the rest of our life will soon be able to go to Krishna's mercy. So but what is the hope of us who are very neophytes and have a limited southern to experience the higher uh, status of Bhakti in this life? Yes. <coughs> There's a verse, which I don't think I will remember now because I was just learning it a few days ago. I didn't practice. <laughs> That's a very good verse that explains this. But it is the next verse after, I can tell you where it is, you can look it up. Uh, where the demigods in uh, chapter 2 of the 10th canto, they recite this famous Yene Rivindaksha Vimukta Manina verse, then the next verse. So in Yene Rivindaksha Vimukta Manina, the demigods are saying, they're describing very strict and austere uh, impersonalists who uh, follow very, very rigidly all the rules and regulations. Actually, the reg rules and regulations of Mayavadi sannyasis, for example, Prabhupada says, are much, they're, they're even stricter than that, followed by the Vaishnava sannyasis. So they may follow all of the prescriptions of Shastra very, very rigidly, huh? without any deviation. And therefore, they will ascend to a very high platform. But the demigods say, Still they will fall down at the end. Why? Because again, 
the booty, Abhishuddha booty. The booty remains impure. Huh? The booty remains impure. Huh? Because they, have, they do not take shelter of the Parampada, the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Then, in the very next verse, the Lord Krishna, uh, uh, sorry, the demigods, they then describe the devotees. And they say that these devotees of the Lord, they may be Prashanti Marga. I can't remember the whole verse, but I remember the key words. So they say, these devotees might be Prashanti Marga. That means they might be have fallen from the path. Prashanti. Um, you know, the path of strict of sadhana and all of this. Uh, but, Tvayi, uh, uh, bada sobrida. If they have this one qualification that their hearts are bound to Lord Krishna, uh, then uh, they will make progress nonetheless, despite their qualifications. Nirbhaya, they use this term, nearby, without fear. Without fear, they will make progress to the supreme goal. Uh, The last line is, if I could remember the whole thing, it would be very good. <laughs> the last line states that, uh, anyway, the, the key word here is Mudneshu. Uh, uh, you see, they may have enemies who oppose them. Enemies who, even like the demigods, because the demigods are there to observe. They, they are dwelling within our senses. And so the demigods may have observed that this devotee has not followed this and that rule and regulation very nicely in his lifetime. So the demigods, they're in the upper <coughs> regions of the universe, and when they see a soul uh, coming, see, going upward, ascending, uh, on this, it is called the uh, Brahmapanta, the path to Brahman then the demigods will uh, step forward to say, wait a minute, where are you going? <laughs> you cannot go any higher because uh, at uh, 3 p.m. on Sunday, <laughs> December 6, uh, 1991, you did this or you did that. You see, they have recorded all the activities. So they will step forward and say, you cannot ascend. But the, these are the demigods speaking. But they say, those devotees who are Bharasaurida, they will step on the heads of all the opponents and go onward, back home, back to God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who comes to try to stop them. Uh, this devotee, by the grace of the Lord, will step on the heads of all the enemies. So, this is the answer to that question. One has to become Bharasaurida. The heart must become bound to the Supreme Lord in love. And this is the effect of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. If one has that heart bound to the Supreme Lord, then you see, success is assured. Also another way to understand this crossing over the head of the enemy is that just like in this Krishna consciousness movement, the devotees they may be, as you say, uh, very simple or very weak or whatever. But if we have, a, if we accept this mission to oppose the enemies of bhakti, the demons, the asuras, the materialists, uh, these representatives of Kali Yuga, who are propagating the most hellish and degraded kinds of philosophy and accompanying activities throughout the whole world, corrupting the innocent population. So there are thousands upon thousands and thousands of such asuras, and they are so powerful. And in this International Society for Krishna Consciousness, we have only a handful of devotees. And as you're saying, mostly these devotees are not so expert. But if they embrace this mission, if fearlessly they go against 
these enemies of bhakti uh, preach uh, vigorously and try to save these conditioned souls who are being pulled down by these demons. And then, this is, the verse is to be understood in this way. By that, by that fearless opposition to the demons, the devotees will triumph. And this is this is a symptom of Bada Solida, that the heart is bound to Krishna. Just like Arjuna. Arjuna didn't want to fight, he had many good reasons. Many good reasons from uh, Pratyaksha and Anuman, from the you know, point of view of what is visible to the senses, and from the point of view of mind speculations. He had excellent reasons to give up the fight. But he could not. He could not. He had to fight. And why? What was the ultimate reason? The ultimate reason you find in the uh, 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna, he be, he's appealing to Arjuna that because you are my dear friend, therefore I'm telling you these things. So Arjuna, he, he agreed to the fight because of his tie of love to Lord Krishna. Therefore he was victorious. Jiva Prabhupada ki jai! Jai! Jai!